Now A has gone to ground, so G to B and G to C. So line to line voltage appearing across two capacitors. So the current has gone up by root of three. And it is 60 degrees apart, no longer 120 degrees apart. The two vectors are 60 degrees apart. So when they add up, it's another root of three. So the net current in the ground is three times cable charging current, three ICO. And that will add to this resistive current. Now this resistive current is in-phase current. Capacitive current is leading current. Leading current by 90 degrees. So they are 90 degrees to each other. So when they vectorially add, it will be, fourth current will be IR squared plus 3 ICO squared. The rule of this application of mounting the resistor and the NGR is to overcome that charging current. It has to be more. As a minimum, it could equal. So if I have 5 amperes of charging current, I must have at least 5 amperes or more of the resistive current. And the reason for that is that the capacitors have to discharge during the zero crossings. Otherwise, they keep building the charge and you'll get transient over voltage. So to prevent charging voltage, maintain voltage stability, limit the voltage rise to no more than the line voltage, 600 volts, you should have the resistive current dominate. Okay. So, if I have 5 amperes and 5 amperes, 25 plus 25, 50, square root of 50, I will have 7 amperes of net ground current. So, this is how the resistance grounding works. So, we have to always consider that there is going to be capacitive charging current added to the resistive current. Now, what happens to the voltage? You heard the discussion. The neutral was sitting at the G point in the center of the triangle. As the insulation breakdown begins to appear, the balanced impedances to ground get affected. The one impedance is lower. The G begins to shift towards the leaky phase. So now I have G to B is less than G to C and G to A. And this can be tracked by voltage measurement. And you can get a systematic indication at once, in advance of the fault. The, weak, weak, the weakness in the insulation is now progressing. It takes a while for the insulation to grow from good insulation to bad insulation, not a screwdriver falling. It's a gradual degradation of the insulation eventually turns into a fault. So you have some time to respond. It's predictive. So this kind of information is very, very useful for predictive maintenance. They already know that there is a problem going to occur on B phase in my substation somewhere. They don't know where, but at least they know there is a problem coming when you alarm. So it is quite normal to look at this phase to ground voltage and alarm at 50% shift. So before it gets to a solid fault, you already get an alarm. You already know that there is a problem coming up. And then when it becomes a solid fault, you have that 5 ampere flow from the grounding resistor and you have alarm already also set for 50%. So you get early warning before it becomes a solid fault. So voltage and current both are available for us to look at and provide information ahead of the situation. So this is the current language in the code. The um, 2018 version, they, are, they did a rewrite of the section 10 completely. So 10-100 was all about bonding and the electrodes and so on. Uh, section 10-200 was about solidly grounded systems, DC and AC. And then section 300 is resistance grounding, immediately forward. In the past, before this revision and rewrite came, resistance grounding was a small paragraph buried into section 3, 1100. So people didn't really know that this. But now it is up front, at the beginning of the section, 1, 2, 3, boom, boom, boom. Immediately you get resistance grounding in the front. So board is expecting a lot of use of resistance grounding, clearly. So they say this is, uh, if the current is controlled at uh, 10 amperes or less, a visual or audible alarm uh, should be provided to clearly indicate the presence of a ground fault, and you don't need to prep. So it gives you a big advantage for power continuity if you maintain the current at less than 10 ampere level by using the resistor grounding. When the resistor has failed, either gone off a circuit or short circuit, the system does not give you any alarms as such. There is no consequential effect on the load. The power to the load continues to flow. 
there is no circuit breaker tripping, there is no indication, so you really don't know. So the code really wants you to make sure that that resistor which has the proper function, the consequence of that failed resistor will be known only afterwards. When a fault happens, if it is shorted, then you get a, a good fault current because it, your system got converted to solidly grounded system and you didn't know that. If the resistor is open circuit, the system now becomes ungrounded, you didn't know that, the power current will not flow and you'll get transient lower voltage causing you multiple failures. So consequence of <coughs> resistor failure is not known. So they have added a requirement for you to monitor the resistor continuously and indicate that the resistor is not in good shape. Okay? So this requirement has been added in 2018 version of the code. So now when you use resistance, Grounding, you have an additional thing to do, not just the resistor, but also monitor the resistor at the same time. Since CSA thought this was going to be widely applied now, they have created a standard for the neutral grounding resistor since it was issued in 2015, standard 295 for a neutral grounding resistor. So this allows the suppliers of resistors to get that equipment certified by CSA so that when it arrives in your job site, it will be a certified uh, unit. The ratings prescribed by the standards are into four part categories, continuously rated resistors, 10 second rated resistors, 30 second rated resistors, and one minute rated resistors. So when you have the desire to have continuous operation with a ground fault, you will choose continuously rated resistors. For medium voltage applications where you are more than 5 kV and your current could be more than 10 amperes, you would uh, trip on a ground fault. So isolate the system. So the resistor does not need to be continuously rated. It's only rated to overcome the tripping time that you have assigned to the tripping uh, of the relay. So those two categories, one is continuously rated, the other is short time rated. So those two categories exist in the standard. The temperature rise permitted for continuously rated this is uh, 375 degrees, and for the other one, it is 750 degrees for short time rated resistors. So now, such a large change in temperature, the material that makes up the resistor with a positive temperature coefficient, you have a danger that the resistor value is now going to increase <coughs> as it heats up. So they have prescribed an upper limit on this, saying that your resistor value should not be exceeding 25%. If it does, then the current is going to drop by 20%. So if you have, let's say, 100 ampere resistor, it heats <coughs> up, and as it warms up, the current starts dropping because you're controlling the current through the resistor <coughs> value. And if the resistor is going up, then the current is now going down, and if your relays are set to 80 amperes or more, well, they will drop out because the current has reduced. So your settings are 80 amperes or less for protecting the resistor, allowing the temperature increase to change the value to 25%. So that's the language in the code. And then there is a clause underneath uh, in the annex which recommends resistance monitoring. This now is being mandated by the code in the 2018 version. So we have both the standard uh, for the resistor and the application within the code now is in tune. So IGARD makes a resistor monitoring relay called Sigma. This um, is sitting on a DIN rail. It has um, two elements, ground current measurement, and it also measures the voltage of the neutral. So I have an access to the neutral, I measure the voltage in the neutral, and then the unit will divide the voltage by the current to determine what this value of the resistance is. And therefore, if you are within the border, it will be okay. If it is outside the border, then throw an alarm. Very simple. This requirement has always existed in the Canadian mining code. M421, they have always used resistor monitoring relays, and this has now become mainstream for all Canadian installations through the Canadian Electrical Code. The code now is uh, taken and modified by the Ontario, and this week uh, they're going to be effective. Uh, 2018 Ontario Code is now in effect. They have uh, declared their modifications to the, to the 2018 version, so the OEs. Well, you see, the Ontario Electrical Code is now effective as of now. A good uh, application support reference is this uh, book, Industrial Power System Handbook. It's
It's um, written by Becky Jacobs. Uh, he passed away a few years ago, but his legacy is his solid handbook on the whole subject of grounding. <coughs> so, and this has a lot of application information, so those of you who really want to dig into the subject and uh, understand the application, this is an excellent reference. Limiting the wall burn to less than 10 amperes, uh, there is insufficient burn for the art to be striped, and it will self extinguish and therefore will not have any art crash. So 95% of the problem, according to this book, is sorted out if you don't allow the line to ground core to escalate to become line to line to ground and to go further from line to line to ground because that RT, the ionized gases kind of balloon as they expand uh, with the temperature. The joining phase now gets connected and now you had a line to ground port which then becomes line to line to ground port. So people ask the question, well, how long does this take for this migration to occur? So the 1584 committee did high-speed films to, in the testing process to determine, well, what is the progression? And they found out that the progression only takes eight milliseconds. Half a cycle of arc will extend it to the next phase. Another half cycle will cover three phases. So within a cycle, your single phase to ground arcing part will become a three phase to ground arcing part. And this was all is all documented in the CS, uh, the IEEE 1584 testing. So there is some uh, language supporting all this resistant grounding in this standards. This is the quote from the Red Book. Uh, these books are written by Industry Application Society. They form committees to write these application guides, and they have been published as uh, colored cover books for uh, eleven or twelve of them, different colors. So this red colored cover, which is uh, commonly called the Red Book, it's IEEE Standard 141. Uh, this version is dated 1993. They put out a call uh, some while ago to revamp and update these uh, documents. And as we speak, they are now into renumbering these uh, color book series into a 3000 series of, uh, and they have expanded the content and even have access to a much bigger library of uh, standards from IEEE going forward including updates. So this red book says high resistance grounding provides the same advantage as the ungrounded systems, yet limits the steady state and severe transient or overheated associated with ungrounded systems. Clear, absolutely clear indication that we should not be using ungrounded systems anymore. So if you have any legacy ungrounded systems, most of them have been converted. If you haven't converted them, it's a good time to convert because you are getting into some further insulation problems uh, going forward. The uh, Green Book, which is uh, standard 142, recommended practice for grounding of industrial commercial power systems. This was updated in uh, 2007. It will be uh, redone again uh, as we speak um, and reissued with expanded contents. And it, the original document uh, here shows here's the reasons why you should be using these resistors. It reduces burning and melting effects in ported electrical equipment such as switchgear, transformer, cables, machine, that means everywhere. It reduces mechanical stresses because the port current is uh, so low it does not create a force, otherwise the port current will create a force which is proportional to square of the peak current. So very high force in the pair when you have uh, short circuits. To reduce electric shock hazard to people because of the straight ground port current because the Turn back only carries 5 amperes or 10 amperes, the bonding conductor has no potential rise to, to, to cause very difficulties. It reduces our blast or flash hazard to people who may have accidentally caused this situation or who happen to be in close proximity to the partner. So clear as well, they have been saying this all along. It's that our courts are caught up to this now because of the safety perspective and then the court requirements uh, have come through. But the distribution was always recognized to have this art flash right from the beginning. It reduces momentary line voltage dip or eliminates it because the power current is low, you don't get uh, light flickers. Otherwise, uh, solidly grounded system, you see the arcing or produce a voltage dip because of the power current flow. And then the testing done by 1584 demonstrated the migration of art from line to ground to line to line, and other phases only takes uh, 8 to 10 milliseconds. So we need to be really cautious of uh, 
not having that part in the first place. So how do we do this grounding? A simple approach is to get to the neutral and then to a resistor. For high voltage systems, there is a possibility that you may use a single phase transformer, high voltage on the primary side, 480 volts or 120 volts on the secondary side. So step down, and that resistor will now allow current to flow in the low voltage, which will control the current flow through the primary. So if I wanted to have a 10 ampere or 2400 volts on a 5 kV system, I could use a 2400 to 240 volt transformer, get that current 100 amperes here, will reflect 10 amperes here. So in this case, the question is uh, two components, reliability of two components versus reliability of a single resistor. So overall cost you will find, if you do a little bit of research on this, that the resistors come out uh, cost effective. And they are available, as you will see from the walk into the plant, that it's a very efficient manufacturing method, so the cost of resistor is quite competitive. So the use of the NGT, as it is called in the literature, neutral grounding transformer, is uh, no longer a cost-effective idea for any voltage. You can make resistors for whatever voltage your application requires, right up to the very high voltage. Now, in many cases, it is not convenient to get to the neutral of the transformer or inconvenient to bring the neutral in. So, in which case, you have the option of getting to wherever the three phases are available to put the grounding. If you have multiple sources, you don't need to go to individual source to ground it. If you are collecting it on a main bus, you can go to the main bus and put a grounding on the main bus using these kinds of options. So this is a zigzag auto transformer that provides a neutral point that allows you to take that to the ground. This transformer size and the value is controlled by how much current you let allow it to flow. So if you are going to put 5 amperes through that resistor, then that size of that transformer now is based only on the 5 amperes. So 347 times 5. But if you are going to have no resistor, as was the case with Bob here, who's saying I need effectively grounded system, then the same zigzag can provide a low impedance ground path because there isn't any impedance, the transformer impedance is the only impedance. So you can use that zigzag as a grounding transformer right across the board with or without the resistor, depends on what your application is. So if you are feeding into Pony's requirements for power in a cogent situation, you are feeding back to the system, and they want to have a solidly grounded 25 kV or 36 kV interface with you, and you have a delta connected winding, then you need a zigzag to ground, and that would be the zigzag without the resistor. Okay. You can also do a, a two winding transformer with a delta providing a circulating current, and then the resistor is mounted on the neutral, so this is a two winding transformer. Or you could have a solidly connected primary with a open delta with a resistor to control the current. So these are alternatives. Of course, these are more expensive than a simple zigzag. So iGuard uh, partners with a supplier of uh, transformers. They don't make their own transformers. So they buy the transformer and the resistor and then put the package together and give you enclosed uh, equipment. So those are the options for grounding. So let's keep going forward here. This is an example uh, showing you that the, uh, the zigzag transformer is simply an auto transformer. It's uh, six identical coils and the coils are cross-connected, so half of phase C, phase A is connected to B, and then half of B is connected to C, and then C is connected to A, so you form that kind of a, a zigzag transformer configuration here. So the zigzag is a colloquial name, it's just zig and a zag, it's like do heaping, it's our terminology, the real name for this thing is a grounding transformer. You could say, and it's an auto transformer, it's not a, the winding transformer, the two windings are not separated, they are cross-connected, so it does not give you isolation. It is for the purpose of creating that neutral that allows you. So when you excite this transformer, equal magnetizing current is going to flow to this, and it will balance out to zero here, no current will flow through the resistor, and it is excited, and it's magnetism will be this, it's magnetized. But then when a ground fault happens, one voltage to ground disappears, and then you got the other two voltages, they will pass through the transformer, zero sequence current will flow, limited by the impedance external to the transformer. So that's how the zigzag is going to help us with the controlling ground fault current. 
So as a designer, I could summarize this discussion up to now by having these bullets saying, I have maximized my power reliability, no circuit breaker strip on ground faults. It's safer distribution system, no arc blast, no flash hazard on ground fault. And the ground current during a fault on the bonding wire is extremely low, 5 amperes or 10 amperes. It's safe, completely safe to operate it for a long time, two days. I was in a mill at one time a few years ago and walking to the substation, I noticed the ground fault indication showing the phase has a problem, phase A faulted. So I turned to my host and said, uh, do you have a fault on phase A? Did you know that? The guy I smiled and, oh, it's been there for a few months. Okay, so because there is no discontinuity, power remains continuous, people have a tendency to just let it be. In other words, they ignore it. They acknowledge the alarm and ignore it. So my suggestion to you is, make an extra effort to help them find the fault. Why is he ignoring it? Because it is tough to find it. Because there is no external evidence. There is no smoke. There is no fire. There is no smell. You don't know where that fault is. In a distribution system like this plant, 600 volts, you will not know where the fault is if there was a fault. You will get an alarm, but then, so, make sure that you have in your specification this one additional element. It goes a long way to have satisfactory operation. To spell out how is he going to find it? Help him find it. And then it will be no so. So when I sat down with him over a coffee and explained to him that he needs something added to help him find it, and then it was crystal clear. He installed it, and in, in an hour, he was able to find where his fault was. Okay, so make an effort to help him find it. Then his distribution is cost effective. Three, five, three phase systems are cheaper than four wire systems. And when you take a four wire and make it three wire, everything associated with the neutral disappears. No neutral CTs, no G element on this breaker. The breaker is only LSI breaker, okay? So not an LSI G breaker, so cost reduction occurs. No termination, no lux for the neutral. Labor cost reduces and the conduit size reduces. You only have three conductors rather than four conductors. So there is a across the board cost reduction of 25%, including all the other effects that come into it. So there was a job we did in US. This was a bottling plant. So the consultant has specified a 3000 ampere, so 480 volt conventional solidly grounded service. So the contractor bid to the spec and then he offered an alternate. And his alternate was cheaper by $150,000. So I got curious. If he has given back $150,000, that means he must have pocketed another fifty for himself first and then given back $150,000. So his actual savings might have been like $200,000. Right? So I'm thinking as to where did he get his $200,000 savings if he's with his alternate. And then you dig into that, you find that he has converted his four wire specification into a three wire spec, taken out the neutral, got rid of all the G elements and then offered alarm system. Alarm system is reasonably inexpensive to add to provide the indication of ground water. So this reduction of the neutral and elimination of the neutral is a game changer, okay? So keep that in view when you do electrical distribution designs so that you don't need those neutrals at 480 and 600 volts widely distributed anymore. There is a tremendous amount of change in the effect on the maintenance. Faulty equipment can continue to run and the repair costs are negligible and small in comparison to what you would have in a solidly grounded system. So if the machine has a winding failure, it's not going to destroy the lamination. It's not going to melt the winding copper. You can repair the insulation where the fault has occurred in the winding. I had a practical exposure to this. I was doing some work for City of Toronto, a water treatment plant on the Lake Shore. And while I was there that day, there was a pump trip out. The, um, there is a very high sensitivity to pump stripping in that there is not enough storage capacity in the city to give you drinking water. 
more than 24 hours, okay? If the pumps are not running, they have a, they have an issue. So they want to keep those pumps running continuously, very sensitive to outages. So that day, uh, when the pump tripped out, the guy came running into the office and said, uh, should I reclose, should I reclose? He is in his he wants to reclose the breaker, get that pump back on. So the engineer says, no, 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 I want to investigate to see what caused the tripping. So he came down and they found that the multi-limit relay had tripped, it had ground fault flag down, high resistance, grounded 5 kV drive, driving the, the motor. So he said, okay, let's remove the covers on the machine. So they removed the covers and they found the end, ends were full of dust. So they vacuumed the dust. And then he crawled in and he didn't see anything obviously from the external uh, winding exposure. So he said, let's uh, remove the rotor. So the rotor came out, more dust. So they vacuumed again. And then it was clean for him to crawl into it. And then he went in and saw where the insulation had been damaged to the lamination. There was so little damage, they were able to repair it on site. Remeasure insulation resistance back into the mega ohm region. They were able to close the motor re-energize and pump it back running. Why? Because the fault current was low to cause damage. It wasn't there. Okay? So high resistance grounding has a major impact on maintenance cost. The damage in the equipment is minimal and it's repairable. The overcurrent coordination is maintained. Selective second fault protection in the case of high resistance can be added as you will see in our discussion our relays have second fault protection. So that if you ignore that first alarm and leave it for a few months or so, you are likely to have another failure, another phase, then it would be a catastrophic current, phase to ground to phase, and then the relay will see the current, high current level, and the relay has a second level at a much substantially higher than the NGR. So our relays are nominally set for a hundred ampere pickup for determining this line to line failure condition and then provides a tripping signal rapidly to isolate the fault. So summarizing it, limiting the ground fault current to 10 amps or less provides service continuity on post fault, prevents R flash, allows faults to be located without de-energizing, and this is what finds the fault, pulse locating system. So our dealers have a built-in uh, technique to help you find the fault, which I'm going to describe in a minute. And then uh, there is no excuse for that guy in the rolling yard. He has he has the tools through his relays to go and look for it and fix it. So these uh, systems are three phase three wire, 480, 600, and 4160 volts, uh, especially in continuous process industries and everywhere. Wherever a circuit breaker tripping has economic consequence, you should consider high resistance ground. And of course, uh, for safety. To sense a ground fault, the technique to apply is uh, application of a zero sequence sensor. This uh, is not a CT, it is not a current transformer. Current transformer means you have primary current that translates into secondary current with the ratio. But this doesn't have that. It doesn't give you secondary current, it gives you secondary voltage. And the voltage is created by the number of turns on the winding. So if I have a, it's directly related to, it's linearly proportional. So N number of turns multiplied by rate of change of flux is the output from the sensor, okay? So d5 by dt multiplied by n. So if I increase the number of turns, I get more signal. It's as simple as that. So the CTs, which have now become sensors in our language, have large number of turns. So iGuard uses 1,000 turns on their sensors, okay? We have a range of sensors that are approximately 1,000 turns. The uh, variation occurs to compensate for the length of the core length and the size of the core to produce equal output so that we don't need a match between individual size. They all produce the right output for the set of relays. So all relays can be used with any of the zero sequence sensors. Um, so you said this is not a zero sequence current transformer. It's, it's, it's a sensor. Uh, it's a current, it's not a current transformer, correct. Not a current, not a traditional current transformer. In a traditional current transformer, you would may have, a, let's say, a 50 to 5 CT or, or 100 to 5 CT. You will residually connect the secondary currents, and then the relay would be calibrated for secondary current in terms of 5 amperes, and then the relay would be set for something close to 
more than 10% of the reading of the thing. So you can go on an adjustment of the reader to 500 milliamps, secondary current. And then apply the turns ratio to see what the primary current detection level is. This is directly sensing primary current, giving you a secondary voltage, and the relay is calibrated in primary current. So the relay, when you set it for 100 milliamperes, is measuring leakage in this wire <coughs> for 100 milliamperes. Okay? So there is no ratio. So it's that way from traditional The sensitivity is the issue. The traditional CTs do not allow you to go less than 10% of the CT ratio. So if I had a 1,000 to 5 CT, my minimum ground fault pickup would be 100 amperes. And on the breakers, you find this, they are nominally at 0 0.2, 20%, okay? So they can't go below. So a 100 ampere breaker can see a 200 ampere ground fault. But in resistant grounding systems, we want to give predictive maintenance. We want to see this leakage appear from milliamperes, 100 milliamperes. We're not interested in high levels. Our currents are going to be low levels. So we have to use something which is uh, of this type, sensitive for detection of sensitive. So this is the technique, zero sequence current sensor. So all three phases pass through the window. The each individual phase creates a flux. The flux is now the phase A flux, B flux, and C flux. They all add up. The net result is zero. There is nothing flowing here, only the load current. The balance is zero flux in the core, so no output voltage. If something leaks to the ground, the unbalanced flux is created, then that produces a voltage, then that drives the relay. So our relay is looking at primary current uh, based on the output to, to the and then that relay can be applied for alarms or trips or whatever you wish to do with it. So these are the range of uh, sensors made by IGAR. The uh, various window dimensions, uh, some are 3 inches, 2 inches, 6 inches, 9 inches, some rectangular. And for low sensitivity, solidly grounded applications where the current levels would be hundreds of amperes, we have a kind of a picture frame that you can apply to existing bus parts and reports outside and so on. So low sensitivity ones are open, high sensitivity ones are encapsulated, the windings are distributed in the windings and then the terminals uh, give you the output to connect to the relay. So, so they, isn't more these are more low voltage. So if you are going to apply them at more than uh, 5 kV, 16 kV or whatever, you need a bushing on the cable to provide the 95 kV insulation. <laughs> the uh, suppliers of the switch gear does the testing. Okay. So he has a 15 kV bushing uh, that's appropriate for 95 kV BIL or higher, 150 or 200 kV BIL. Then the CD, the sensor is a low voltage sensor on the outside of the bushing with a large window. This one is actually a little more cost for like the normal. Uh, this is more sensitive. More sensitive and more cost. More cost, yeah. The high permeability core, um, so it's a strip, uh, high permeability core material to produce a sensitive uh, output, lots of flux for minimum excitation. Mu is very high, and then the windings, cost of the windings, large number of turns. So there is a uh, cost associated with that, right? Remarkable it is that these sensors have remained unchanged for 50 years. There was a 50th anniversary of the rectangular sensor last week. The rectangular sensor was uh, invented and designed in Canada and it has been in existence for 50 years. Incredible. Okay, so uh, iGuard assembles the stuff in boxes. Uh, as you will see on the floor. So this uh, box contains a neutral grounding resistor. It's wall mounted. It has ventilation holes and then a barrier and then controls are below. And the, uh, when the ground current appears, you get a red light to indicate that you have an alarm. If there was a, a temporary situation, then the amber uh, goes into yellow from, from red. And you have a situation on the front where if you want to locate the point, you put a pulsing 
you start it, and then you go find it, and then you can decide the boss. So this is called a detective, assume, because it helps you find the fault. So the registers are not, not simple registers anymore. They are registers with control associated with it. So you bring 120 volt control to it and bring the neutral in and put it on the wall. So it's independent of the circuit. It's independent of the transform. It's a separate unit that's conveniently mounted, easily applied wherever it's suitable. So particularly for retrofit applications where you want to convert uh, ungrounded to this grounded systems. Excuse me. Yeah. How does this system work with you have backup generators to so for the backup generator, you will have a normally um, situation where you would go through a transfer switch. So the normal without supply. Transfer without transfer switch, you want. Oh, without a transfer switch, common bus. You'll see an example. Just hang on a few seconds. Yeah. Okay. So I was going to describe you this uh, pulsing system. So in this pulsing system, what we do is we short out a portion of the resistor. By shorting this out, the current increases. So let's say I have a 5 ampere nominal current to this resistor. I'm going to short half of it so that the current will jump from 5 to 10. And I will oscillate this contact at a very low frequency, at 1 per second. So now the current is going to be 5 amperes, 10 amperes, 5 amperes, 10 amperes, 5 amperes, 10 amperes. <coughs> then I can see this signature <coughs> of oscillation. If I use a rope CT and go along, where my fault impeder is. So my fault impeder has been indicated. If I put a sensor here, I will see that needle oscillate. That needle is shifting because I'm on the line side of the fault. If I move that sensor over to the load side of the fault, this is load current. It balances to zero. There is no ground current. So there is no oscillation seen on the meter. The oscillation appears only when I'm on the line side of this. So it's easy to find where this is. So if there is a panel on here in the side, and I recognize there is a conduit coming out, and I go and look at those conduits, and I'll identify which one has a problem from the oscillation in my hand meter. Then I go down the line where the load is and see whether it is in the load or before the load. So if it is in the load, we are there. If it is not, you come back halfway and see whether it is on that side or this side. If it is on this <coughs> side, you come back further halfway. So you build a series, one half, one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth. You are truncating rapidly. Three or four measurements, you know where the fault is, right there. So this technique has been applied and used and widely accepted. It's, uh, we have tried other things, but this is by far the most effective and practical. It's done outside the bonding conductor. You're not opening any doors. You're not shutting off any breakers. You don't need to disturb the, the load at all. And you know where the fault is just by looking at the flow of current and the oscillation of the pattern in your handheld meter. So it, it is very convenient, it's easily done, and that's the rope CP. So this is an accessory that should uh, be kept uh, where the high resistance dominant system is, so that when the time comes, they, have, they can go to it and locate the fault. The clip uh, allows you to go outside the bonding conductor. The signal from the sensor is normalized to 100 millivolt AC scale. And then the multimeter gets plugged into this so that you are on a 100 millivolt AC scale looking for that oscillation. You're not measuring current because you are outside the bonding conductor. The conductor will find all possible return paths through the bonding conductor to go back to the transformer. So you are only looking at the change pattern. It distinguishes from the noise. The noise will be eliminated because you have a set pattern for change of the resistor value. So you are looking for that needle shifting periodically to your capacity. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that. This uh -huh. is this, this, you go back to the UI diagram over there. Yeah. Assuming that you have tech data. Correct. So the normal measure that you would have the CP. Yes. Yes. So what we have found by uh, on all these years of experience with this stuff that the bonding is such an interesting idea that the there are many multiple paths for the return current. 
and not 100% come back in that jacket in a day. Some of it will come. That's why we are not measuring the current. We are only looking for a pattern of change. So we are looking only for that needle to shift. So even if it is only 15-20% current, it's enough to give you that indication. Yes. This one is actually used in the water against that. Correct. Correct. Yeah, you just uh, exactly. Take the, take the Correct. Exactly. So you don't have to go to the three pages. You by opening the door or anything, you do it outside on the conduit. So it is very safe. Yeah, even conduit. Yeah, even conduit. Yeah, even our conduit. We find that the bonding structure allows the current to distribute. And it's a rare situation that you get 100% back and you're cancelled out. There's always some that leaks anywhere. And so, our people uh, at IBART who have done this field uh, support work, we have found that there's always, always, always some uh, that evidence of the there's, yeah. there's the, In the next presentation, which is presented by IBART, very flexible relay, big uh, adjustment on the pickup level. Yeah. It's uh, ground fault and arm track is built into one, solidly grounded or a distant grounded application. The sensitivity is you can go right down to 0.1 amperes or 100 milliamperes for the distant grounded systems up to 5 or 10 you would apply and then beyond from 100 amperes to 1200 you apply from solidly grounded systems. So it is applicable to any kind of distribution system. And it has uh, three arc flash sensors. The tripping time on the arc flash is one millisecond, so very rapid uh, effect. And then the breaker trip time gets added to it. So if you step back and see what the breaker situation is these days, the, we are using molded case breakers, right? Low voltage distribution, 480 and 600. These molded case breakers are roughly two and a half cycle of operating time. We have insulated case breakers from all suppliers, and they are also similar operating time. And then for medium voltage, we have vacuum breakers. The old SF6 is obsolete, so now only three types of breakers are there. Vacuum breakers, insulated case breakers, and molded case breakers. So all these breakers are 50 milliseconds operating time or less. So if I add another one millisecond in the arc detection, I could isolate the fault and see it around 50 millisecond time frame. And from our earlier discussion of fault damage, we know that to get to from 60,000 kilowatt cycles down to 6,000 kilowatt cycles, my tripping time had to be less than 0.1 second and half of that. So I really have a good operating margin for preventing exposure to increasing damage. So these uh, kinds of relays would uh, help us do that. So the, the contact is a solid state contact, no time delay added by the electromechanical, which is a backup uh, relay. There is a pre-trip indication prior to the main relay tripping. It also accepts uh, residually connected the one amp or five amp CTs for solid grounded systems. It also accepts uh, zero sequence sensors for sensible non-fault information here, 100 milliamps and so on. It uh, monitors uh, it on the display unit, and then the display unit has a modbus capability to bridge to whatever other protocols you have to use, Ethernet or proxy bus or device net, or, and so on. It also incorporates loom selector interlocking for solidly grounded application. So it's a multifunction protective relay. So in a zone interlocking, the relays will communicate to each other to not have uh, any time delays or you can eliminate time delays, so all relays are instantaneously set. The bottom relay will, if it sees a fault, will now put a restraint signal into the upper relay to prevent it from tripping. This sees the fault which is here, will restrain this relay, so it will not trip, only the closest relay to the fault will trip. And that's the principle of uh, zone interlocking. So this zone interlocking can be uh, integrated uh, by using in these IGART relays. <coughs> very powerful relay. The next relay uh, IGARD makes is a multi circuit relay. So, this is in their fourth or fifth uh, generation evolution. 
the original version used transistors way back in the late 70s and then they migrated to uh, integrated circuits and then now the current version is uh, microprocessor driven. So there is a voltage uh, information from the bus to this module that will identify which phase is the fault and then the individual zero sequence sensors will get connected to these modules which are individual PIRA modules and then you can have supplementary other things like NGR monitoring and R detection on the same derail as I'll show you in a minute. So current sensing and voltage sensing. So now the display will show you what phase the fault is on and how serious the fault is. It is 90% of the resistor electrical. So this will start monitoring in 10% 10, 10 and up, uh, from 10%. So you get uh, prior warning on 40 meters and warning of uh, 40 phases that are evolving into ground faults. Very effective maintenance tool. This will be installed. I'll show you an example where I got puts it in a panel, um, but normally you would have it installed in a switchgear. Um, and the circular or panel supplier will install it. And they're all familiar with our relays. They've been around a long time. So whatever, whoever is your panel supplier will <coughs> integrate that in its uh, system. Uh, which signals are available for PLC? The PLC, uh, you have a choice. You can take a contact <coughs> into a PLC, uh, or you can take communication output. The output is from Modbus. So if your PLC uh, accepts Modbus, you're directly connected. If not, then you'll have to have a bridge from that to the PLC network. So your PLC may be using Ethernet or some other protocol, then or 61850. So then you'll have to convert from Modbus to, to it. But would they be able to see the signal just the fault? Yeah, you will see. It will identify to you what the Peter and alarm has been raised. And it will tell you what meter the fault is on. So now we apply it so that we have a grounding resistor on the transformer. The uh, NGR has a pulsing system here, which is driven by the uh, unit. And then zero second sensors mounted on the meters. So now you have the option of deciding whether you want to have continuous operation or you want to have a trip on the first fault. <coughs> so this is a first decision designer has to make. So let's say he decides on uh, continuous operation, no trips on ground fault. Then uh, he would have the option of putting a second ground fault uh, setting so that if you get a second ground fault here, then you have a face to face situation between to the bonding conductor. And a serious fault current will flow, so these two sensors will see it. And you only need to trip one of them, you don't need to trip both. One would isolate the that line to line condition, and then you go back to single single fault, which you can have with five amperes controlled by the resistor. So the uh, the decision to which one to trip is uh, decided by assigning a priority to your feeders. So the relay allows you 16 levels of priority, and it's up to you to figure out which is high priority and low priority, and program the relay so that your two faults are involved. The lower priority will always trip first, and not with the higher priority. So this is how the relays work. So the transform in that case, it's a white, white line screen. This is a white transformer. Yeah, if you had a delta transformer, yeah. then you would need a zigzag with a yeah. rounding resistor. Yeah. So right. the NGR will change. Yeah. So this is a white transformer, so I simply have an NGR. Okay, so now we want to integrate uh, NGR monitoring in that same bin rail. So we have a DSP DRM module which will uh, monitor the voltage of the neutral as well as the value of current passing through the NGR. Alarms if you are open circuit, alarms <coughs> if you are short circuit, complies with code 21 and complies with the current code requirements. In many cases, you have um, better reliability of operation and more flexibility if you have secondary selective systems. Not only primary selective, but also secondary selective. So you have line one, line two, with two transformers, with a tie breaker. So you normally operate with a tie open. You have one main on this side, another main on the other side, and the bus is bifurcated. So now, 
when the tire closes, when you are feeding it from one transformer, the other transformer is uh, not available or the main breaker is open, then the one bus uh, requires you to have one system with these two relays connected, so they need to operate at one relay. So we, we make these communication modules to assist us controlled by the auxiliary contact of the tire breaker, so that when the tire closes, the two relays come together and give you the main time in application. So very simply done. And because of the sensitivity to art flash, we have now added a art detection module to the DSP. So now the DSP is a comprehensive total protection, not only resistant grounding, alarms, pulsing, helping you find the power, communicate, but also go to the next step to warn you if you get a face-to-face -face situation of arts. So this is now a total solution when you apply this one multi-circuit relay. And this unit has 21 possible inputs. And these inputs are divided into three groups. Seven fiber sensors, seven point sensors, or seven pressure sensors. So we give you the option of AND function to allow you to increase reliability and monitor uh, a big installation with multiple sensor inputs. So now the functions on the DSP are fault and phase and indication of alarm, post fault alarm, feeder indication, options for tripping or alarm only, second fault selective trip with priorities, pulsing system to help you find the fault, NGR monitoring to comply with the code, main time main and complex feeder arrangements, and then optical sensing arc flag detection module, and then mod bus communication. All that is into this microprocessor relay. So we think we have a very powerful relay that addresses the arc flash problem completely and reduces the probability of failure because of the high resistance grounding. So we build this into a box, as you were saying. Can I have everything supplied from the factory in the back? And yes, there is a box that has an isolation device for the Isolating the NGR, should you want to do any maintenance work, you open the switch and then open the cover and then go inside the box. And then the relay display sits on the top, the relay is mounted inside. And you need to bring the zero sequence sensors input into the box, the neutral into the box, and you're done. And if you have a delta transformer, then you have to have a supplementary device for the zigzag. So the box itself is a resistor plus the relay. So let's look at some single lines to just uh, go forward and see how all this thing gels together in actual application. So I have a delta delta transformer here. Okay, so these are now becoming rare, but we used to use a lot of delta transformers in the past. So with a delta connection, you need a artificial neutral to create the neutral point, and then this becomes a grounding location for the supply, and then the you want an alarm system, so you don't need to trip anything, no shunt trips are connected, simply zero sequence sensors to identify the feeder has a problem, multi-circuit relay with an alarm output, uh, communication to display, <coughs> and then you have a uh, number of modules to it can be extended to give you a larger system like up to 50 altogether on the one thin rail with one power supply. And so you can, this is not an expensive addition all you needed was the zero sequence sensors and zigzag transformer with one relay. So the bus can distributed among the feeders because you're using and the, it is extendable. So if I have a three stage distribution, then in this case I have a Y connected transformer, so I need a grounding resistor, pulsing type to help me find it, then one DSP for this board, another DSP for this board, and they will communicate and zero sequence sensors all over. So this is uh, how these systems can be built to integrate into the distribution at various stages, right up to the load. So let's look at the uh, document again and see where we are with this column of methods. So we took a look at the high resistance grounding in the previous, and now look at this two. The two says arc flash relay. An arc flash relay typically uses light sensors to detect the light produced by an arc. 
Once a certain level of light is detected, the relay will issue a trip signal to an upstream overcurrent device. So in the recommended methods, this uh, figure say as an item two. So to really have an understanding of how the damage is expressed, I took a look at the fault current on the vertical axis and the time delay on the bottom axis and plotted these test points based on what was the damage. It's clear that there is a linear relationship of time with damage. If the time is longer, my damage is more unless my current is lower. So if my current is lower, my <coughs> take a little bit longer and not suffer as much damage. So reducing the time will reduce the damage and reduces the incident energy exposure. So I need, really need to focus on time of operation with these aircraft relays. So all relays are, so we have this black box now that we have put together called Guardian. It contains the architecture <coughs> relay as well. So all the same alarm and triplets are indicated here, all the same and so on, plus our flash. So we have a version of the Guardian to give you arm flash protection integrated. We also make a dedicated arm flash relay with multi circuits, optical, 12 optical sensors in this relay. And this relay can use current and optical sensing as an AND function. And it will provide a simultaneous uh, trip output to oxy four breakers. Again, with uh, modbus communication. The unit has a built-in test feature to check the integrity of the fiber at all times. We saw the discussion of Sentry earlier. These are the optical sensors, the fiber and the point. Quick question. And, yeah. When you say you detect the current and the uh, light, the current, do you distinguish the waveform? Yeah, we see the um, the end function I'm going to describe here uses three-phase sensors, three-phase current, uh, CTs, current transformers. And it will say that, okay, you see an arc, but you have a current at the same time. So it verifies that you have existence of a current to establish the, the tripping function. So it's only the magnitude of the current. But that's magnitude of current only. Correct. Only magnitude of current. It's suitable to you adjust it to suit. So in this case, it's supplied in metal pack switchgear, 15 kV kind of a situation where optical sensors are distributed in the switchgear in different compartments. And then you have a combination current plus arc detection. So you reduce the arc flash energy exposure everywhere in the low voltage and the medium voltage switchgear. A common problem is what do you do on the line side? So we are suggesting that we should be applying this arc flash sensing so that it covers the entire distribution. And I'll show you an example in a minute. Even let you go to the primary side and trip it with a fast acting breaker. Conventionally, we have used load break switches in the past. So we have a 15 kV, 25 kV, 36 kV load break switch we have used. But those load break switches are slow devices even if they are trippable. First of all, they may be manually operated, not trippable switch, but if they are trippable switches, they take more than five cycles, five to seven cycles to open. Their arcing time is long, and they are a slow device, so they are not quite satisfactory. So if you want to achieve arc flash protection in the entire distribution system, including <coughs> the line side of the breaker, you need to have a interrupter on the high voltage side, which would be a vacuum breaker. It doesn't have to be a metal clad cell. It only needs to be a replacement for the load break. So you can simply replace a load break with a vacuum interrupter and you got it. Okay? So here's an example. <coughs> I can do all my protection on the load side quite easily by applying resistant grounding, by putting sentries and not flat sensors and so on, and I'm good here. So in my report comes on off flash study, I will be <coughs> less than 9 calories. But what happens on the line side? If the fault is in the terminal box, 
in here or here in the cable connection on the line side, then my protection is on the line side in the fire ray fuse and a load break, that's not going to give me low energies. So in our class studies, you will often find that they have um, red marked these situations where they are exceeding 40 calories because there are no PPV available beyond 40, right? Which means there's 130 calories or 250 calories. Have you seen any of these r class studies? Yes. So now the question is, are you going to address it or are you going to ignore it and put it in the file cabinet? So I had a situation in Ottawa where the, the user said, we need to address this. They had a campus transformer, one transformer feeding a bunch of buildings. And each of this was a medium voltage input to the incoming unit substation in those buildings to serve the building load. And they said, well, we often have to go to this primary side and we need to deal with this, including the transformer terminal box on both sides. They were okay on the unit substation from the secondary breaker all the way down in everything and the distribution. The calories were manageable, but on the line side of the main breaker, they had a problem. Mm -hmm. So we said, uh, have you thought of hardware <coughs> protection? Have you thought of optical sensing media? Do you need to go All they had to do was to replace the load break in the same enclosure with the vacuum interrupter. And that's it. So that's an incremental cost. It's not a full scale replacement. Just the load break needs to be replaced with a vacuum interrupter. Now in Canada and US, we have a need for a visible break. <coughs> when you apply vacuum interrupters, there is no visible break. You can't see through the vacuum bottom. So you need a disconnect with a vacuum interrupter. Okay, so manual disconnect. Just to for a visible break. So you interlock. So when the vacuum breaker is open, you can pull the switch, offload, and you have a visible break. Now it complies with the code. And you have a viewing window to see that visible break. So visible break with a vacuum interrupter is all they need. So once you do that, you have this. So this uh, is an effective approach to, to addressing these uh, high exposure situations where you can keep the calories low. So here are some numbers. If I use inverse overcurrent relay, my clearing time is uh, about two seconds for a fault current. Incident energy is 211, too high. If I go instantaneous inverse, then I'm down to 0.5 seconds. Now I'm 47. If I use these uh, architect relays, the mm -hmm. optical sensing hardware relays, I'm definitely going to be less than 84. In fact, I could be as low as 50 milliseconds. Now I'm down to 9. So now I'm down to simple short sleep. My exposure is very limited. Okay, so because my tripping time is very fast. So this is the This is uh, detecting the line side of the breaker to trip the high voltage side of the transformer. Correct. <coughs> okay, so you need an interrupt. It's, it's on the high side. So the tripping occurs on the high side, the fault could be on the low side, on the line side of the end breaker. Correct. 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 Okay. <coughs> so here is a plot of the actual fault current. This A is the fault current. You can see the AC and the DC, right? There is a decaying DC associated with the symmetrical AC. So AC symmetrical plus DC decaying is this fault current. V is the arc voltage. See that flat top arc voltage is nonlinear. It doesn't follow the same sinusoidal function. So V is the arc voltage, A is the fault current. A C is the pressure buildup in the enclosure. If you have an arc, there is an enormous amount of energy exposure that builds the pressure in the enclosure. Pressure in the enclosure will not build without an arc. If you don't have an arc, you don't have a pressure. The pressure accompanies the arc. So existence of pressure is an assured situation. It's guaranteed. It is going to happen. And it 
follows the arc within a few milliseconds. So you have an arc, immediately the pressure starts to build. So if I sense the pressure, I have a very secure indication that I have a problem. So we use these pressure sensors. These pressure sensors came from gas insulator switchgear technology. We have been using them in that kind of switchgear for many, many years. They have been used on SF6 circuit breakers for many years. It's a diaphragm inside. So it's a concave situation. The pressure builds, it becomes concave. So very quickly, it changes the, the micro switch attached to that diaphragm to give you an indication that your pressure has built inside the equipment. So it adds only four milliseconds to six milliseconds to the tripping, the action of the, the data and the pressure follow-up. Below here are the optical sensors, the fiber and the point. So these are mounted inside the switchgear compartments, and you have the option of adding pressure if you wish to, to prepare an and so you see it and you also have the pressure at the same time. Sorry? Vibration, you hear something, vibration, vibration. Oh, vibration? Yeah, how the sensor is sent to the aircraft. No, 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 no. They have been tested for marine application. They've been uh, subjected to all kinds of other things. There is a